I'm the director of Goodman Gallery in Cape Town. The gallery is delighted to host the South African Friends of the Israel Museum this morning for a short walkabout of our current exhibition, um, where we were kindly shown works by uh, the artists Sarat Marx and Sue Williamson. My name is Sue Williamson. I'm an artist. I'm based here in Cape Town and I work in various different media. But today I'm here at the new premises of the Goodman Gallery in Cape Town. It's in an old convent and I'm talking to the South African Friends of the Israel Museum about this particular exhibition which is called Fathom and in particular about my work which is behind us as we stand here and it's called Messages from the Atlantic Passage 6. Um, this show is called Fathom. It's actually part of a um, collaborative platform that was born out of uh, COVID in which galleries started to think about how we can work together. Um, so the platform is called Galleries Curate and this show is part of the RHE platform. And so what's happening internationally over the kind of past couple of months and for the next few months is there's uh, exhibitions about water popping up everywhere. So in London, in New York, in uh, Mumbai, um, and in Cape Town. Um, and I'm not sure if they will be in Joburg as well, but yes. So this show is kind of looking at water, but also looking at coastlines. Um, so this work is by Kilowangi Kiehenda. It's called Marinostrum, which is the Roman term for the Mediterranean Sea. Um, the work was produced in Arles um, on the salt pans and he made it during his residency. He had a kind of cross residency between Arles and Sardinia. Um, so he's really looking at the kind of both the dialogue but also the complexities of the relationship between Europe and Africa, specifically thinking about migrancy. Um, so here he's thinking about the Mediterranean Sea and he overlays the salt pans with this black cloth, which is both something that's very beautiful, it forms its own abstract shapes, but also um, represents death. Um, so this is comprised of 52 or 53, I can't remember the exact number now, separate panels which form together with this cross in the middle. Um, this work here um, is by Jeremy Wafer. Um, it's a new work, this is the first time it's been exhibited um, and it's, it's called Fathom, so the exhibition lends its title from the work. Um, it is a length of 30 metres of rope, um, each with a lead weight uh, placed with a metre between. Um, and during this kind of new body of work that Jeremy's really just starting, He's thinking about sounding lines um, and depths of water and also um, his relationship with uh, his father's death when he was young. Um, his father was buried um, out at sea in Simonstown. So he's reflecting on quite a lot of um, both material but also um, personal histories to do with the coastline. Um, this work here is by Alfredo Jarre. Um, it's called Searching for Spain. The work was taken, uh, the, the photograph was taken during a one week residency in Algeria. Um, this is a castle uh, which is right next to Algiers, and Alfredo kind of passed it and, and saw how you can see this kind of coastline of Spain in the distance. Um, so he's pointed his camera towards Spain. And the castle was being used by migrants as they waited overnight or for sometimes for a few days for the perfect conditions to cross. Um, so it's, it's really part of a body of work in which he's looking at both news imagery but also the passage of people. So this work is called Monolith 3 by Pamela Sundström. Um, she produced this work, uh, I believe in 2016. It's, during a residency in Carcafo in um, France. So I'm not sure how familiar you are with Pamela's work, 2013. Okay. Um, Pamela's work is often figurative. Um, and so during this residency and 
Amongst the other two drawings from this monolith series, she was looking at how to create narrative and movement without a figure. Um, so you see here that these kind of quite uncharacteristic for Pamela lines of kind of moving around. Um, and she's also been uh, looking at Flemish landscape paintings and, and this kind of angle of looking down from above. The, the kind of idea of landscape features quite often in her work, but usually with a figure in the forefront. This figure is replaced by this abstract geometric form here. Um, she was looking both at platonic solids, but also at Jules, Jules Verne's center for the uh, journey to the center of the earth and about how voids in the earth can become um, kind of uh, transient spaces, places for reflection. This is a work called um, Messages from the Atlantic Passage, number six. And it's a work, a piece about the transatlantic slave trade. Each one of these bottles has the name and details of one person engraved on it. And that person, it tells you the African name, the name, their given name in other words. It gives, tells you the, the Christian name, the new name that the slaver would have given the person because he wanted a name that he could pronounce like Fernando or... And it tells you where they were born, how old they were, and their age weight and their age and sex and that information has been taken from an old shipping document they've come from the archives both in in, a, in the states and in britain and a register was drawn up by two universities the university of emory university in atlanta and also hull university in england who drew up this register of, of slave journeys and there are more than 36,000 of these journeys which took place over four centuries of pe people who were taken from the west of Africa to the Americas, either the north or the south or the Caribbean, to work as enslaved people. I'll tell you some more about this piece, but to go back to the beginning of my involvement with this whole history of slavery, it, it all began in 1993 when I was, at the Ven I was exhibiting on the Venice Biennale on the South African Pavilion and a Dutch curator invited me to go to a town called Huren in Holland and make a piece in the town. And I went to Huren and I went to the museum there, the West Fries Museum, and I was struck by the absolute similarity of the collection in this museum to the collection in the Cape Town Castle. There were the blue and white VOC plates. There were the great big portraits, the heavy furniture. I could have been in Cape Town. And the reason was that this is one of the towns in which the VOC ships sailed forth. So there was a direct link between Cape Town and this town, Huren. So I decided that I would make a work which linked the town. And at the same time, it was just before the second Johannesburg Biennale, 1997. And Ocquian Wezo, the curator, his theme for that Biennale was trade routes and geography, and it was all about colonialism and how, about, how the trade routes, the early trade routes had, had formed the history of the world. So it seemed like a really important theme for me to work on. And then the same curator in this, in this museum in Holland said to me, oh, but in Cape Town, you have the best slave records in the world which was really an astonishing thing for me to hear. But because people, there was just one port of entry, not many, and the Dutch were quite meticulous in their record keeping, everybody who came into the port of Cape Town and was dropped off would be registered. And all those rec records still exist in our own archives and they can be viewed in their own, in, their, in the old high Dutch writing. But a historian here called Anna Busseken wrote a book about it and she has listed all of these names and so that was what I've, I used to make that first piece and it was called Messages from the Moat, the moat being the moat which surrounded the Cape Town Castle and I imagine people kind of 
trying to drop things into the motor's messages to the outside world. And so that was on the Johannesburg Biennale, and there were 1,400 bottles in that piece. And it's actually in the collection of the, the South African National Gallery. They haven't shown it for a long time. It was shown at one point in the Cape Town Castle. But that made me interested in this kind of wider context of, pe of people who were taken from Africa. And in fact, I must explain that the people, the slaves, the enslaved people who were brought here, what happened was that the ships would come down from Holland, they'd stop in Cape Town, you probably all know this, and they'd go to the East Indies, pick up spices for the European trade, pick up people to work in Cape Town, come back here, drop people off, and then continue back to Holland where their, their, their wares would be sold. So that was the, that's how we all came here in the first place. So a few years ago, I thought of extending this whole thing, this, and I, be I began to research slave records, and that's how I came across the, this um, in extraordinary trove of information. It's, you can actually find it online, slavevoyages.org, um, which has been put together by these two universities, and you can actually look at these old documents and the information from it. It's called slavevoyages.org. And um, it seemed to me that we kind of think of this as a kind of a mass thing, you know, we, we, we don't imagine, we just think of this mass of people being moved across. But it's very, I wanted to point out that each of these was a person, a person with a name, an age, a height. And some of these were children too, I mean they're children of seven or eight years old who are included on these ships. So each, I made a series of five of these, five of these nets first of all. They were shown at Art Basel on Art Unlimited. And then they've also been shown in India on the Kochi Biennale. Kochi was another of the VOC headquarters. And um, the idea, of course, is that people were treated like commodities. They were just swept up, treated, jammed together in ships, transported across the sea. So on each of these, I put the actual information. So this represents one voyage. The ship was called the Negrito. It was flying the Argentinian flag. Um, it went in 1833, it left in 1833, it left from Benin in Ouida, it landed in Havana, Cuba, 534 people were on the ship when it left, and when it landed there were only 490. So 44 people died at sea. And each of these, as you can see, they're each, every single bottle is engraved. When the water falls over the bottle, the engraving so it disappears a bit, but it comes back, of course, when the bottle is dry. And the soil inside is a representation of the land that people were taken from. It's a little bit of the heritage, which is always carried with people, even if you remove them from their home. And I think it's kind of still relevant today because, I mean, we have at this end of the room, there's this piece, at the other end, there's Alfredo's work, which is also about migrants now trying to leave Africa to, to get to Europe, a kind of a reverse voyage in a way, to get a better life. This group has tried to do experiments. They went back to places like Benin, for instance, and they, they had, they asked people, they got sort of indigenous language speakers to pronounce the African names and try to see if they could track people back. But I don't think, I think there's too much time has gone by. And I mean the records, the early records, because I actually did some research in the States too, and I found records of, of, of sales between one plantation owner to another, but it would never say much. It would just again give us a name and a, so you never knew where exactly that person came from. I mean that information was lost. So the work is called Particles, and it builds on another work which was called Far Corners. So what you're looking at is a kind of a landscape. It could be a vast sort of mountainscape. It could be a sort of oceanic landscape with waves. But essentially, that landscape has been constructed with the corners of maps. So each one of those corners I've um, constructed to give an illusion of depth. 
They're not just the sort of 90 degree corners of maps. They've been constructed so that it appears as if you're looking at this sort of vast landscape of cartography. And it's built on the idea of, I mean, essentially, I've been working in, in my work a lot with the idea that, yes, a cartography tries to denote landscape. It tries to convey landscape as a, as a construct, as something that is um, manipulated, as something that's controlled, etc. But, it, but, but a lot of my work works towards cartography as a landscape. So the language in which we understand the world is a landscape in itself. So, so that it's the sort of landscape of that language. So in this case, it's as if you're looking into this vast archive, this sort of vast archive of map upon map upon map upon map. And I suppose landscape upon landscape upon landscape or approach to landscape on approach to landscape on approach to landscape. So it's that kind of logic that I wanted to get. The, um, I suppose one of my primary references would be Eastern, uh, particularly Japan uh, Japanese and Chinese watercolors in which you see those beautiful just landscape watercolors in which you see the sort of outcrops and the mountainous landscapes sort of peering through the mist. Um, and, and Eastern uh, traditions of perspective works differently to ours. Um, with Western perspective there's a sense of entering the landscape in Eastern perspective, there's also a sense of what's called vertical perspective. So that, so that it's not just a sense of looking deep into something, it's also a sort of sense of awe as looking up at something. So, so in, in, in this, in sort of lifting the horizon line, so it's right at the top, there's a real sense that you can kind of dive into it, that there's that sort of vastness. So each one of these maps are from uh, um, an archive of maps that was destined to be pulped. So, it's a, so, 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 they were, so, so they were maps that have been kind of excommunicated by the, the archive. The archive no longer needed them. They were going, I sort of rescued them from being pulped. And what I li love about that is that if you see each map as a particular view on landscape or a particular view on sort of the phys physical reality or the, the world around us, then each one of these depicts a sort of new view, a new view, a new view, a new view. So, so it's a landscape of, of a sort of density. But what I hope happens within it is that you have a sense that behind this hill there's, there's a world and there's another one and there's another one, that, that there's this perpetual sense of something that escapes you, of something that is kind of at once escaping you, but, it, but, the, but at the same time is kind of covered by a new view or a new way of seeing or maybe a new moment or something like that. So into this landscape, so once I've built up this sort of landscape or archive of, of these corners and I, I would really urge you to come and look up close. My interest in these corners and in the edges of the maps um, comes from the fact that it's, it's kind of beautiful when you really start working with maps that they all have this border that's been built into them. Now the border contains all the information about the map and what's interesting about maps is that it's very concerned, I mean obviously it's about space, it's about landscape, but it's also very concerned with time. So really a map is a kind of space-time object. It's concerned with the date that the information was, was documented, it, was, it, it annotates when the, um, when the map was drawn, when the map was published, when the archive received the map. It often has multiple stamps and things like that. And if you, if you start really looking into this, you'll see that I try to um, sort of bring as much of that information into it as, as, as I could. So it's as much about sort of spatiality as it is about time. Um, but getting back to the borders, so the borders contain all of that information. It contains the information about authorship. But at the same time, the borders are built in, sort of designed into the map because it's the area where you hold the map. So it's the area where the map is managed. It's the area where the cartographer or the archivist or the user would inscribe notes. But as, like, like you can see up here, some sort of handwritten details. But it's also the areas that get scuffed, it's the areas that get the cigarette burns, it's the areas that speaks of the use of that map. So there's a sense of the people who have handled these maps at the same time. 
Um, so once, you, once I constructed this whole landscape, which was a sort of laborious process, and I think this, this work really, I can't look at it without under, like seeing my studio during the lockdown period, because um, it, 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 lockdown offered me the opportunity of really just slowly engaging with this work in a kind of meditative way. And a, a, and a lot of my work is about a slow, repetitive process that builds up and sort of accumulates into complexity. But this work really engaged a lot of sort of making, stepping back, sitting and kind of staring myself into that space. And what I started doing was to sort of, I kind of imagined myself flipping little bits of, of little specks of map into that space. Because it was as if that vastness was constructed and that the, the, the sense of a sort of vast landscape was in stark contrast to lockdown. And to, um, I mean, I'm blessed to have a home studio, so I was working from home, but that sense of being contained and then constructing this sort of vastness at the same time. Um, my interest in the blue areas on maps is something that's been consistent in my practice maybe over the last 10 years. And it started with a process more than 10 years ago when I was doing far more figurative work, but I was doing a cartography in which I reconstructed roads on maps to construct the image of my grandfather. And, and it, was a, uh, it was a drawing made of my grandfather during the, whilst he was on his deathbed. So I was in a sense sort of mapping my grandfather as he was passing away. And it offered a beautiful process in which essentially I, would, I was losing the territory, I was losing my, the person, but I was left with a map. And, and so it's that relationship between the real and the memory, the real and the, and the documented that, that came into play there. But in that process of drawing my grandfather, so you, let's say you'd, I'd be fixated on... I mean, the, the, the process of drawing is a beautiful process of, of lingering. It's a process of contemplating and lingering and taking time to look at something. And so in that process, let's say I was drawing his nose, I would be fixated on the line. Um, and, and what always fascinates me in my work is that the drawing process necessitates me finding a particular little bit of line in order to draw with. But with that line comes a, set of, a, a section of territory. As, uh, the rest of the fragment contains information that isn't, doesn't pertain to that line. So in that case, quite often I would find that I'd get little bits of like a dam or ocean or things like that, these little bits of blue. And when you bring it to the body, of course it reads as breath, or it reads as, as air. Um, but I became fascinated with this idea, these bodies of water that were contained within the map. Because essentially, water is this fluid medium. It's an area that, it's the part of the landscape that doesn't take mark making, it doesn't contain borders in the way that a map wants it to. Um, and so to me, the, the bodies of water became the sort of subconscious area of the map, the sort of emotional area that's contained within the map. So the language of the map has to contain the, this fluidity that waters hold, but it's the antithesis of the cartographic impulse. So, so I've developed on that idea and I've made a, a, a whole series of works in which I only collect the, the bodies of waters on map, etc. In this case, I was just collecting these little slithers of blue from, from this variety of maps that was lying around. And I took great joy in sort of collecting a bunch of slithers and then imagining myself kind of throwing it into that space. In the same way that in, in the sort of Chinese landscapes, part of what makes that sense of distance um, pertinent is the sense of what, what is obscured and, and, and actually an awareness of the space between you and that object. So it's this so yes, there's a mountain over there, but what, what I think makes those watercolors so beautiful is the sense of space, the sense of what divide, what splits you from that thing, that, the, the sort of volume of air between, or distance between you and that thing. So, so as I started sort of flicking these in, they look like they're just floating like mist or like particles in the air, but each line that each particle contained had to sort of click into the grid that the landscape provided. So if you come and look up closely, each line aligns with the line that's already there. So, so, 
so on one hand, it, it, it had to fall within the sort of loose grid that the sort of mountainous illusion uh, constructed. But at the same time, it started making this sort of space in between visible. And my interest for the show for which this was created was um, very strongly with this idea of distance. And distance is the opposite of knowing. So if we want to know something, we bring it close. We, there's a persistent sense of bringing everything up close, up close, closer, closer, and screens are even, even more of a sort of one-dimensional thing. Think cart cartography as an impulse is a cartography of bringing what is over there close here, so you can, you can kind of control it from here, from the two-dimensional, you, you get to affect what is happening over there. My interest in this was how do I construct a series of images, how do I counter the cartographic impulse in a way that would facilitate a sense of distance without bringing that distance close. So, so my interest was in how do I fit, because distance would be a space where boundaries are unclear, distance is where the, the certainties um, start to shimmer, it's where, where things are more uncertain, where things are more unclear and and so how do I create a cartography that embraces that sense of unknowing or unclarity or fuzziness? Um, and so what I love about these is that they start flickering on your eyes, these particles. And I think maybe I should close by saying the idea of particles is a very personal sort of anecdotal story to me, but it, but it, but it speaks back to a moment in my childhood when I was lying on the floor with two of my best friends um, and we were staring at a blank wall and maybe you know this is a test but maybe you know that when you stare at a blank wall sometimes you see little sort of like a buzzing on your eye um, and, and, and those could be flecks of dust, it could be floaters in your eye, it could be the mechanics of seeing one doesn't really know but as a child I looked at the wall and I said to my friends I think I can see air and my one friend said, yes, he can see it too. And the other friend said, it's impossible. You can't see air. And the one friend I'm still very close to, the other one became a chemical scientist, and, um, and we've lost touch. But, <laughs> but there was a pertinent sense at that moment for me between what you allow yourself to see and this the, uh, sort of didactic way of seeing and a more sort of... Um, maybe a uh, poetic way of seeing things. But so that idea of particles as something that, that hangs there in the air, but as something that divides that two ways of viewing, uh, or, or did for me in that moment, um, between a sort of scientific way of seeing, which of course the cartography denotes, or a slightly more poetic way of seeing, a more atmospheric way of seeing. So essentially that's what the work tries to do, is it takes it from a didactic way of seeing into a kind of atmospheric way of seeing.